My name is Nereli Zubiwa. I'm a gender and communications expert, but what I really do is I'm a human rights activist and black, queer, radical, angry, intersectional feminist. Human rights activists, because we are all humans and it's sad that we find ourselves in these parts of the world where really nobody is keen to let everyone enjoy their rights. And so that's why we all actually have a responsibility to be human rights activists, to not be quiet while things go bad for other people just because it's not us. So that's why a human rights activist and feminist because first of all, I was born a woman and while I identify as a gender non-conforming person, I still acknowledge that I was born and I live in a, in a female body. And by that mere factor, you know, this war that has always been lodged against the body of a female, yeah, or bodies of non-men, for lack of a better reference. And so for that, that's why I am a feminist. Black, because I'm black, I'm proud about it. And it's always a pleasure to let the world know, especially because I'm light-skinned and I know people always like look at you and they're like, you know. Plus we've had politics about colorism and how we have this tendency of locking people out of their blackness because we think they're not as black as what we consider black, or even ostracizing people we consider too dark and all that kind of stuff. And so it's my way of claiming my blackness wherever I go. Uh, queer because, like I said, I'm a gender non-conforming. Uh, otherwise, politically, I like, because I like poking holes into politics. By poking holes here, I mean questioning what is seen as political correctness. And so queer because I'm a lesbian woman. I'm a woman who falls and romantically is attracted to women. So that's why I'm queer. Angry because there's a lot to be angry about. If you're Kenyan and you're not angry about anything, who are you again? <laughs> I kind of want your life, not necessarily, but we have a lot of things happening in the world right now, but most importantly in Kenya that are supposed to make us angry. And so um, it's sad that as far as I'm concerned, probably it will be a permanent title because I'm a millennial and probably I'll die before things stop making me angry. So I'll probably be angry my whole life. But the goal of it is to be, to always remain angry at things that are supposed to make me angry until we change things for things to stop being like, stop making people angry, stop making me angry. So it's like my mantra for wake up and do something, get up today and go out there and do something because if you don't, then you'll wake up angry again tomorrow. So yeah. And yeah, that's intersectional. I forgot intersectional. Intersectional because your issues, my issues, and every other human being's issues have a point of intersection. So the way I do my work is ensuring while I'm championing for women's rights, for example, I don't oppress men. While I'm championing for LGBTQ rights, which is pretty much at the center of the work that I do, I don't oppress you know, heterosexual people. I don't oppress anyone pretty much that to understand my safety is a result of your safety, is a result of everyone's safety. So we all have issues that bring us together. And immediately I put you at risk. I could have easily put myself at risk. I could have easily put everyone else at risk. It is effective and it's not anger to, it's not anger to kill. It's a, Cause generally we are an angry. <laughs> Lord, yeah, that's why the terrorism is a thing. That's why, as a queer person, queer phobias, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia are a thing. It's because there's a lot of anger. But the only problem we have with that kind of anger is people are angry at things they shouldn't be angry about. Uh, I'm a lesbian, why are you angry at me? Why do you hate me? It's not, it's not because by the virtue of me being a lesbian, I'm gonna do anything to hurt you. But meanwhile, your house will be robbed uh, and the person you'll be angry at is your get man who didn't steal. <laughs> but you'll really just find ways to direct that anger to someone who was supposed to take care of your property. You forget you should be angry at a thief, you should be angry at a system that has created so many inequalities that someone is lacking and that person had to come to steal from you to be able. So like the anger is not a bad thing. Anger is what informs change. Mahatma Gandhi was really angry, but he figured since I'm at power and I'm a, you know, I'm a dictator, how don't I do things? Why don't I do things my own way? Many people will sit and converse and think that is a bad thing, you know, the whole aspect. But his idea of why he did what he did was because he was thinking, I have this power to make decisions for everyone. 
to have a duty to make decisions, regardless of how people will look at them badly or in a good way. I have a duty to make decisions that years from now, like decades and decades from now, people will still look back and be like, I'm glad this happened. Sankara had a lot of power, right? Sankara had a lot of power to choose, you know, I can loot, I can loot, I can take everything from like my countrymen and just go with all these things and, you know, tell everyone to everyone to go fend for themselves or something like that. But Sankara, Sankara chose the path of, it doesn't make sense if I fight, but I don't include everyone who is supposed to, who is, who is a stakeholder in why we are fighting. So what if men fight, but we leave women behind? Are we going to, are we saying when we finally reach the, the land of freedom, we'll only have men? The land of freedom needs everyone for it to, to be to be sustained, right? And so just the thought of, we all have individual responsibility, but the collective responsibility is us taking up the individual res responsibility. That I'm angry, you have to be angry, he has to be angry, everyone has to be angry. And then when we are all angry, we put that anger together and then we sit and ask ourselves, I, I, this the next year voting will be my third time. For the last two times I've voted, I've, I've really been able to define how it takes all of us being angry to change things because I have been angry and it's sad for me because in the in both in 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 all the times in all the times that I've seen people voting and then in the times that I've voted there is no time I've seen a leader that I voted for ascending into power that is to say it's two things it's either many people voted for this leader that's why they're there or there was no point of all of us voting because maybe the election was rigged and so it doesn't matter. Why I think we were not angry enough is because if if my anger and your anger came together and the anger of IEBC to want to change things and the, and the anger of Kenya as a country and the anger of the systems, like we all collectively bring our anger together, then maybe we wouldn't find ourselves where we are today. And we might not want to talk about it, but Kenya is doing really badly in terms of debt, of debt currently. Will we want to talk about it? No, because on the other side of privilege is people who could care less about where Kenya goes. But on this other side of privilege is me and you who are suffering because of the bad economy that we are experiencing. And so for me, it's about collective anger, despite which side of privilege you're in, despite where you are, despite how you wake up and the first thing that invites you to the day is a beautiful sunshine and all that kind of stuff. Remember some people are in some sort of, a, uh, you know, you know, in some room that they can't, see the same sun you're seeing and those people also deserve to see the sun so we all have to be angry and regardless of how angry they are in that solitary confinement they need you to be angry on their behalf so we all have to be angry for things to change it's not anger to distract it's anger to bring us together onto the table and if the table doesn't work for us it's anger to demolish the table and put up another table that we can all be able to say you know all of us are here now what do we want to change Because first I live in a country where um, I am illegal, constitutionally I'm illegal, right? It's either I walk around and be careful where I say I'm, I'm queer or, and all that because it can easily attract violence to me. And the problem with that is that if I attract that kind of violence and someone maybe attacks me if I go report, that's like literally me giving myself in because then there are many opportunities that will come up of me being expected to say, no, I am not a lesbian. For example, if I'm at a police station, I'll be scared to say, well, me, I won't be scared. Personally, as me release, I won't be scared. But essentially how the setup is for queer people is that if you're taking a, taken at a police station and the idea is you're reporting an attack, for example, a queer person will generally fear to say they're a queer person because when they say that, they, they'll, they'll be taken to jail. Because the only other way our government and the system has a way to prove you're queer is by you saying you are because the other one was scrapped off by, by a, a ruling in court in 2018, if I'm not wrong. Um, and it involved them, you know, doing tests to try and find out was there any kind of kernel knowledge that happened so that they can verify if you're queer. But right now it's just about you saying it and, you know, the kind of anger that you will meet will be very destructive because we grow up in a society that has been taught to think just because someone is queer, that person is a bad person. Yeah, it's not according to our norms, I wonder what that is, or moral fabric, I wonder what that is, I'd like to buy many meters of that fabric, 
and see what I can be able to do with it. But pretty much, you know, all those things. Also for me, because of that, that's one of the things. Like for me, that is very important. And in all my platforms, be it social media, online and offline, be it on tables of policy, be it like in whatever room I sit, my duty has always been uh, what about queer people? And it's not just about, you know, bringing queer people to the table. It's really having policies, having laws, looking to ensure we have laws that, you know, protect all lives regardless. That even if you think people are different, so what? All of us are different. Show me anyone who is the same as you in this room. Nobody. Just because someone is a man like you doesn't mean they're like you. They're just an, a human being altogether. Are they a man? Yes. Do they live like a man? Yes. Do, do the other man live like you? Yes. But are they you? No. And we are all different in that way. Uh, how did we come to a place where we, we, we notice our differences and we make those differences a problem when they shouldn't really be a problem? So that's one. Um, the second thing would be children. And for me, probably children because we live in an ugly world, for lack of a better reference. And I know there are things we can't prevent from happening, like children being corrupted at the end of the day or things like that, because children are also people who grow up into themselves and become whoever they become. And that's that on that. But as a, as a country, we are not keen on protecting children. We are not keen on, like there are many things we are not keen on. And I'll give you an example. Yesterday evening, if you've had an organization called Usikimie, the Usikimie, courtesy of Njeriwa Migui, they went to rescue a child from, I think, Kisumu, if I'm not wrong, who is an intersex child, yeah? This child is only six years old, and when the mother gave birth to the child, and the father noticed, the, like, the father was told by doctors that the child is intersex, the father ran away, he disappeared, he's never been seen again. The woman has been scared to take the child outside, has been scared to interact with the child. She's been ostracized because of having this child. Up to the time she needed to be rescued, it was because, of course, at six years old, the child has started developing, playing with kids outside and all that kind of stuff. So it has started becoming even dangerous for the child. So goes rescues the child on 26th, I think, of October is International Intersex Day. And there's an organization in Kenya called Jinsiango, which deals with intersex people. And when they rescued the child, they brought the child and the mother to Jinsiango, where she was able to have conversations with other intersex people and find community. Because one of the things she was told constantly was that, you know, the child is a curse. And you know how we look at curses. We are going to kill this curse, right? And to a mother, this is your child. You don't want your child to die just because your child was born different. You didn't write anyone a letter and tell them, bring me an intersex child over here, you know? And so that happened. And then yesterday, Jerry put the post on Facebook. And then someone commented, some lady commented on that post and said, sometimes I wonder with this God. So according to God and the Bible, men should marry women and women should marry men. Who are intersex people supposed to marry? And many people won't see that problem any problem with that with that question. I wouldn't either if the context wasn't the post was about a six year old. But you see how we see a post about an intersex child and instead of looking at it from a point of a child who deserves a right to life, who deserves a right to be protected, who deserves a right to be safe because that child didn't order to be born intersex and some people are born different and that's just fine, right? But this person who thinks every other human being's life should zero down to who they will marry and the sex organs they're born with. And this is a six-year-old. How, how did we get to a place where we sexualize children? How did you get to a point where half the news we watch every day is, you know, cases of pedophilia and, and sexual abuse for young children? How did we get to that place? So for me, children, because of that, we've become a society that somehow we know children are the future, but somehow we are not keen on protecting that future. And that's where we go wrong, that we are here trying to, next year we'll vote. The goal will be to secure a future for Kenyans, right? But the same future we're trying to secure is the same future you're not trying to protect. Future is built of a lot of efforts of now. There is no future if you're not doing anything about it now. Yes, I can hope to be 60, but if I don't do anything, what will my 60 look like? Will I just be this shell? Because we all have these bodies, right? Will I just be this shell at 60 that didn't do anything to make my 60 more fulfilling than my 30 is? You get? Yeah.
I'm an activist, so my work is probably to sit in the gap of being questioned. And what we question mostly is heteronormativity because since we were young, for example, let's have a one-on-one, -on -one, you and I. Since we are young, you are straight. I don't want to assume you are straight, right? Since we were young, did you watch shows that had, you know, heterosexual couples, that is men and women who are dating and all that kind of stuff, right? Did that influence how you are straight? So you see, heteronormative ways demand that because you see things, you become things, but that's not true. Because the way you were brought up is the way I was brought up. When we were both growing up, the TV we watched was the same. It's not like back in the days, TV characters were gay. They weren't gay, right? So we could sit here and argue me being queer, me being gay, me being a lesbian is a Western culture. There's a very thin line between a Western culture and just a culture because look at the buildings around where we are shooting. Show me what is African about that because there's nothing African about that. Simple things like that. Show me the roads, show me cars, show me all these things. And yes, I'm not saying Africans are not innovative, very innovative, very creative people, right? But all these concepts are borrowed concepts, right? And we are okay with those concepts. We are okay with borrowing even debt from first world countries, which are Western countries. But where we draw the line is when people actually come out and say, I'm gay, and we consider that Western. Which part of that is Western? Because I was born and brought up in Kenya. And if we are going to fault the Western world, whose fault is it really? Is it mine or is it yours for exposing me to that world? Look at the, 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 the history of you know, Christianity, for example. If there's one thing we, we deal with that is really Western is Christianity. Because for Africans, it is more spirituality than, Africa, than, than Christianity. Christianity came from 1844 when missionaries checked into the coastal part of Kenya and they started going around. And when you do your research keenly, you'll notice all this was just a, a mission for these people to steal from Africans because they came to Africa and they noticed Africa is very rich in so many things and we can steal and they did steal because look at us where we are at right now you know when IMF comes calling we will not have an answer we'll be hiding because the money we are supposed to pay them we can't even afford and that's the reality we like to look at western culture with a, 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 a you know a touch of double standards where where if it's about you know asking for money from them we are cool if it's about funding show me any programs that are about human rights in Kenya that are not being funded by the Western world a lot of them and we are happy to take on that money right but where we draw the line is if Mary Liz comes out and says she's a lesbian complete with an assumption it's a Western world agenda people are being paid to be gay i wish i was being paid to be gay so then i'd stop being poor and be very rich and then probably leave this country because uh trump has never been my favorite person but there's one thing he was right about these our african countries are shithole countries and it's not because our countries are bad kenya is not a bad country the people in it are bad people and our leaders could be bad people but we also make bad people because if our leaders are bad people but we are the ones who vote for them or we are the ones who sit pretty when they rig into power then we are equally bad you know and so we can sit here over and over and say it's western culture we can sit here and blame whoever we are blaming at the end of the day i don't remember Waking up in in America or in, in the UK, for example, miraculously without knowing and in the room I was in, I was being taught how to be gay. That's the only way you can qualify this thing being Western. I also don't remember in my home growing up with white people who are teaching me to be gay. I remember just growing up in a normal African setting where I happened to be a last born, so I had older siblings. None of them came out as queer, so they were not an example. My parents are definitely straight. None of them were an example. But my feelings is not something you can interfere with because I feel what I feel. And for the longest, I think the biggest struggle with Kenyan queer people or African queer people in general is the fact that we struggle with our sexuality and our identity because you are only exposed to heteronormative ways of doing things where... A girl is supposed to like boys. In fact, we are taught gender is just men and women. Where do intersex people go? Where do transgender people go? Where do all these other genders that are not necessarily men and women, where do they go? So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, um, you know, what happens to my feelings and the experiences I have. The experiences of, you know, when you feel giddy when you see a girl you like. And for me, I feel giddy when I see a girl I like. How do... Where do I toss those feelings? And then where do I borrow feelings of now I'm supposed to see a guy and go giddy about it? Because I don't feel giddy. 
And if you look, a lot of those issues have contributed to how queer people experience abuse because queer pe people are having to live in heteronormative ways where I say I'm a queer person who is not accepted in my community or in my family and because of that, I'm just going to marry as a facade. So I'm going to get married to a man and keep a marriage. But pretty much I'll be experiencing abuse because then men have also, while women are being taught to sustain a marriage, men have been taught... Uh, <laughs> In the marriage, you're the boss. Nobody should disrespect you. And so even if your woman communicates the fears of them being queer and everything, you're going to beat them to the pulp and probably kill them. And, and we might not have room to speak about that because if you go and report, you might have to hide why you killed this person or even run away and never to be arrested. Or like literally the truth never comes out when it comes to us. And so for, for me, it's never really the Western culture. For me, it's our inability that as a people who come from a background that has really rich culture, because African cultures are really rich. African cultures are really diverse. If you're gonna say, if you're gonna say, you know, being queer is a Western culture, how are we gonna classify things like rap for example is rap western because it is western back in the days in african cultures women and men walked around almost naked and the cases of rape were not that high a boy will see a girl he likes he will follow her until he knows where this girl stays and then he'll go back home to tell his father dad so here's the deal i've seen a wife somewhere he will not treat that girl badly just because she's half naked or anything like that but we've become a society that sexualizes people looks at people and thinks you know just because people enjoy this kind of freedom be it sexual freedom be it political be it whatever kind of freedom people are enjoying and then we decide we take that as their difference and we ostracize them because of that and that is what is the problem whether it's western or not it doesn't matter that is what is the real problem western culture it will come and go the way other things come and go as africans we will remain to be africans what, what do we uphold? African culture is about community. Do we uphold community in how we operate? We don't. Because immediately someone is different, we don't like them. Immediately a woman leaves a marriage, we don't like her. Immediately, immediately a child, you know, a child who is a boy, for example, wants to become an, a musician instead of a doctor. We don't like him that much. We think he's a failure. There's a lot of small differences that we think, we think, affect us somehow we've created this weird platform of this weird perspective of that they affect us that if i'm your mother and you want to become a musician you failed me as your mother and so because of that we think when people are just going around you know experiencing their bodies seeking pleasure as, as it should be are being rendered as illegal as criminals and being treated badly just because of that yeah, because even in queerness, we don't stand for abuse. We don't stand for unconsented sex and intimacy. We don't stand for all those things. We don't stand for pedophilia. We don't think an adult who is over 18 should have anything sexual to do with a child who is below age, the age of 18. Because constitutionally, if you're below 18, you're still a child and you can't make your own decisions about anything like that. But people have decided to look at us and be like, just because we are open to like, Honoring our feelings, pretty much that's all that we do every day. We honor our feelings. It's such a difficult journey, but we have to remember every day that at the end of the day, Mary Liz is who Mary Liz is. And I have to remember to honor that every day. Yeah. I think one significant one that made me exist the way I exist currently online was in 2010. So I had just cleared high school in 2009 and then um, I was just going about my business in, 20, in 2010 on social media. But I like posting pictures, yeah? And so I'm the kind of person, I find good, sun, good sunlight, I take pictures. I find a good camera, I take pictures. I love, like, I love taking pictures. And so I would take pictures and post on social media. But one afternoon, in 2010, a friend of mine wrote me a direct message on Facebook and they were like, have you seen your pictures? Your pictures are going around. And then I was like, the whole concept of social media, if you share it, you kind of don't have control over it. And then they're like, that's not what I meant. I meant someone has taken your pictures and somehow um, the pictures have your face, but they have naked bodies. That happened and my pictures were making rounds. And apparently the story around it was that, oh, be careful of this lady. 
she sends nudes and then asks you for money and all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, I had just come from high school. I was young. I was a little girl, right? So I was scared. And, and, and it was really scared. And it is really wrong that things like that are happening to people, right? Uh, but I remember from that time, I, I deactivated, not I deactivated, I deleted my Facebook account. Never to go back to it again. I deleted, of course, if you delete the account, it goes entirely with everything. So I deleted it. And for a while, I had to stay without being on social media because of the fear. And it was a lot for me. It was a lot because from my timeline, you could see all the faces that have been used are mine because it's my pictures, but the body is not mine. And I can't see that, but you see the rest of the world doesn't know that because not everyone has seen your body. So nobody, nobody is gonna think that's not you. And these people who sit you know, behind keyboards and try to, to you know, Photoshop and do all these things that they do with people, pictures and everything, they have time, you know, bullies and trolls and all these people they have time that's the thing and so that happened and it was really bad but it really informed the kind of person i've become I've become the kind of person who it's not because i don't care but really i don't care on social media and my I don't care doesn't come from a point of I don't care really. It comes from a point of before I post something, I've already thought of where could it possibly reach? How could it possibly affect me? Uh, what are the things I stand a chance to lose just because of these po pictures that I've posted? But also, how much do I gain as an individual? Because for me, that is the most important thing as an individual and also as you know, a collective in terms of communities that I work with. And for me, that is very, very important. And so... Over time from there, short, of course, shortly after I started another account still in 2010 and I've had that account since and it has transitioned. It has transitioned from an account of a young girl who was scared about, you know, their pictures being misused on social media to a girl, to a young woman, to a young person that now understands that social media is like my, my red carpet, it's like my runway. I'm the one who has power over it. For the longest, sex has been used against women, but the shame is in women taking up the, bl the blame and being ashamed about it. That's why in the ridiculous world we live in, men will go buy sex from women, but somehow women are the only ones that are prostitutes, men are not. It's, it's how crazy things like that happen, right? And so for me, just realizing my life is mine, how I exist on different social media platforms is how I want to exist. Do people have power? They like to think they do have power, but I like to differ. I'm the one who has power on social media. I'm the, it's, it's my platform, right? That's why social media is com, com, compartmentalized in such a way that you have your account, I have mine, you have yours, you have... And then we all can follow things that we like and we all can block, ignore, do away, not be bothered with things we don't like. And so for as long as it's my timeline, this is my territory, it's my empire. I get to decide what goes and what doesn't go. And if you're not comfortable with that, it's okay. I'm not forcing you to be comfortable, but I am going to force you out of the door of my territory. You get? And so just creating that platform because, like I said, it came from learning. Many people will come into your space, but it's me to decide who stays. You can come to it, but you stay if I say so. But if I say you don't stay, you don't stay and that's, and that's that on that. Some people are gay and that's fine. Yeah. Some people are lesbians and that's fine. Some people are transgender and that's okay. What matters is that we are all human beings. Yeah. And if your only reason to hate me is because of who I have sex with, then you are the problem the world needs to solve, not the gay person you're attacking, not the lesbian, not the transgender person, not the intersex person. You are the problem that we need to solve. Let's all stop being the problem. Let's at least try being the solution.